Science Club, I run a global warming aggregation website where Joe figures prominently, uh, frequently. Uh, but my question is for Sam. I want to hear the France story. Uh, okay. Um, so there's a professor at NYU, uh, he's a law professor, Joseph Weiler, and he's the editor of like the International Journal of uh, some comparative law thing. He also hosts two websites where he hosts a scholarly book reviews. And um, he hosted a book review written by another professor uh, who's a, a professor at Col uh, University of Cologne or something in Switzerland, uh, critiquing uh, a treatise that was written by an Israeli author uh, about international court of justice like procedure, totally dry stuff. And uh, the, the book review called this uh, the original treatise, something like a rehash of the current legal scene and unproductive. Um, and got, uh, so Professor Weiler gets a letter in the mail from this Israeli author uh, saying, I demand this defamatory, the, the book review you're publishing is defamatory, I demand that you take it down on your site. Um, and he doesn't. He, I mean, he looks into it, he writes back a very, very thorough, very thoughtful, um, sympathetic. You know, I know how hard it is when your work is criticized, but I think for the sake of academic discourse, I'm going to leave this up. And plus, hey, it's not even my book review. Um, he's in June. And he's going to be appearing in criminal court in France. Um, he's being criminally prosecuted for defamation um, for hosting this other professor's scholarly book review, uh, which, among other things, said that the work was unproductive. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a terrible story. We don't know. I mean, it, it could get kicked out very quickly. I don't want to disparage French law, um, but it's a scary story. Um, and it's one that could never, ever, ever happen in the United States because of Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. Professor Weiler hosts this scholar's third-party content. He is completely and utterly immune. Uh, well, that's an overstatement. He's immune from most things, certainly. Yeah. I hate to disrupt the order of things, but it looks like Phil has been able to join us. So <laughs> if you'd like to come up, Phil, um, then let me introduce him a little more thoroughly. Um, Phil is the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT. He's the author of six books and a prize-winning health and science reporter for both the New York Times and the Washington Post. During some 20 years at the Times and Post, he's written more than 300 front-page stories. Phil is the author of Protecting America's Health, the FDA, Business, and 100 Years of Regulation, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Science and Technology. His most recent book, Rx for Survival, Why We Must Rise to the Global Health Challenge, was a New York Times notable book of the year. Hiltz, whose journalism career began in 1968, was the New York Times reporter who broke the story of the tobacco industry's 40-year cover-up of its own research, showing that tobacco was harmful and addictive. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. We're in the throes of uh, our program. We have 12 fellows each year, but today was the day we were picking the 12. And there are six judges. It was very uh, difficult. <laughs> so, go ahead. Don't let me interrupt. Oh, I, I'm done with that. We both. Yeah, we both. Oh, you've already spoken. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where the conversation has gone, but uh, let me say so something about my view of it from journalism. Um, as a reporter, when you're working day to day on stories and um, you're thinking about trying to keep your stories fair, trying to be, be uh, careful about what you say about people, what kind of things you do, how to mix things, and then you see uh, really outrageous stuff on the web, you, you begin to get this feeling like there's something wrong. There ought to be some norms, there ought to be some rules, uh, until you go to the history books. Uh, and I spent a lot of time reading in the history of journalism, and uh, this period may look bad, but it's not the worst. The worst, there was a very bad period, uh, 1790 to 1820. There was a very bad period, 1890 to 1905, when really outrageous stuff was in the newspapers. Uh, people calling each other names directly, calling each other adulterers and murderers and all this kind of stuff very straightforward, all kinds of things that were plainly lies and that we have since found were lies and intended lies. 
So um, while this period we have now is really disturbing, uh, the reason we have it is because we had, didn't put out rules in the first place. That was the idea. And so um, I always hesitate to think, okay, what is the norm? Let's go find out what the bottom norm is because I don't want that one. Uh, I like how we had come up and in, in the period since 1950, the norms were rather high. We had been doing quite well. Um, and there was really pretty good discourse. Uh, now, unfortunately, we, we've fallen back down, and I think it's the direct responsibility of the new communications meeting. So we have to wonder um, if there's a, any way of reestablishing re some norms across those media. I think it, it may not be possible. We may have turned a corner that we can't go back. And we may be at a permanently lower level of discourse, at least in some areas. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we may just have to get used to it. I don't think we can uh, put any clamps down, uh, at least as a reporter, although it makes me mad all the time. And, it, and trying to write stories in which you uh, deal with somebody else's lies is hard, because you really don't want to um, write a story in which you are giving somebody a quote, and they're saying something you know to be false. You don't want to put it in the story. Um, but those stories are developing, that is happening. So it, it's a very great burden on reporters and a very great burden on readers to, to start sorting through this stuff. So um, my take on it is um, I really don't like this, but I don't see a way out. Thanks. Um, go back to questions. In the last week, uh, a story meme has uh, surfaced. It was covered by uh, uh, Lily Cohen in the Times last Thursday. Uh, the subject is epistemic closure. It's a debate that began when um, an MIT graduate by the name of Joe Ranzi, who uh, is scientifically literate, dared to uh, assert the scientifically obvious in a column in National Review. Uh, whereupon he was taken to task for talk radio by Mark Levin and, and the, uh, the other committees in that league. Uh, this led, this, this stemmed, the, 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 the expression stems with an introducement conversation uh, by Julian Sanchez. Uh, and it simply refers to the, the historical tendency for uh, interest groups in the sciences or otherwise. Uh, to largely listen to each other. And it refers to the, the, the closing off of their sphere of information or its facticity uh, from, from uh, their political opponents. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, given the mere fact that, that, that science blocking appears, at least to some, to be an uh, extension of the culture wars, whatever it means, both on the right and on the left, um, what can be done, not just to, 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 to restore civility and facticity to the conversation, but to assure that, that in this unruly democratic conversation, there are actually two sides to the argument. Um, I'd like to conclude by asking a statistically necessary question, just to establish the baseline uh, for this conversation. Will all the Republicans present raise their hands? Yeah. I repeat, it. will any? No? Zero. Yeah. Um, would you mind identifying yourself? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm muscle size. I used to be at the Center for International Affairs here at Harvard. And I'm now a fellow of the Department of Physics. Thank you. Oh, and I stopped blogging about two years ago. About the time I was fired from Wall Street Journal. <laughs> sure. Uh, this story has gotten a lot of attention. I think you came up to me. I wasn't sure when you used the phrase epistemic closure. This is uh, this was Jim Manzi 